when a murder is discovered. And what you have is a young lady who is in a suitcase which has been deposited on a railway embankment and covered over by twigs and other foliage. How many cases of natural causes would end up with that scenario? It doesn't just destroy one life. And then you find out what really happened. You read it in books, you see it in TV shows and everything else. It's really tough. Well, there isn't a day go by that you don't remember something. It tears communities apart. When I arrived at the scene, the first thing I went and saw was the body in the wood. It's up to the police to not only solve the mystery. Homicides are the ultimate. That's the climax. That's what this job is all about. And track down the killer, but bring them to justice. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of this case is that conviction was achieved without the body. In this episode, a teenage boy is kicked to death on the street. I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? Meet the murder detectives. Each admitted that he'd seen the fight take place, but equally each denied that he'd taken part in the actual assault. Who reveal how they caught the killer. In the tranquil Surrey Hills, an after-work night out for two brothers and their friend had ended in tragedy when one of them died in hospital following a fight with local youths. I got the phone call. I was at home and I was, I was planning this trip away uh, down the Thames on a boat and packing and, and uh, literally the phone rang and uh, you just have to change your plans. DCI Colin Sutton was appointed the senior investigating officer on the case. The murder took place around about midnight on Friday going into Saturday. They told me the victim was only 18 years old, his name was Christopher Donovan, that it had been a fight in the street with another group of youths on a busy dual carriageway road, although it was late at night and there wasn't much traffic about and that he had been in collision with a car after being assaulted. The fight had also involved Christopher's brother, Philip. When police arrived at the scene, it was clear he was injured. Both young men were rushed to the local hospital and officers were sent to contact their parents at home. They said, Chris has been involved in a fight, he's seriously injured. I thought it was a fight. And when I went and grabbed my car keys, he went, no, we're driving you. They drove us down a four-lane A road, and that was closed. They got four lanes in the central reservation over the other side of the road, with these policemen walking up and down, and this policeman in the car, the driver kept apologising, kept saying, I'm sorry, we've got to go this way. I said, I don't know what you're apologising for, we, we know, just get us to the hospital. And when we got to the hospital, Phyllis' face is all blooded. I've got to be honest, I went up and said, what happened? You said someone hit me. I said, you must have done something. You don't get hit for no reason. No one hits you for no reason. And I was more or less blaming him. Then we were taken into this room, weren't we? Philip described the gruesome details of the fight, and it was clear that Christopher had come off worse. Well, we hear what they did to Chris. The doctors come in and they said he'd lost a lot of oxygen to the brain, didn't he? Yeah. We're looking at severe brain damage. And I'm thinking, I've got to get this, I've got to get that, we need this equipment, that equipment. Funny, that what goes through your mind, isn't it? And while I'm thinking all this, trees are four in the morning, the doctors come in with the police and the um, chaplain said, Christmas dead. I can remember it like it's happening now. And I'm sure that's true for you and all. And because that's the memories, they don't go away, those things. And the emotion of it. I can feel it now. As we're telling it, it's rising up inside of me. I ran out the door. I ran down the corridor. I remember running into the arms of a policeman down that corridor, and he was putting his arms out and he held on to me, and he, he said, we're going to get them. That's all he said. 
It didn't take much, and then I started shouting and screaming. I can remember that very well and lashing out. In this quiet town, a death like this was very out of the ordinary, and the police put together the best team they could to tackle it. When Christopher Donovan was murdered, I was one of a handful, half a dozen or so, detective chief inspectors in Surrey Police. So I was given this job to investigate at the weekend. The day it happened, I'd not been in Surrey Police for very long. DCI Sutton had cut his teeth working in the Metropolitan Police in London. I'd kind of almost fallen into being a, a detective by accident. It wasn't my ambition when I joined but I got involved in a murder investigation when I was a young PC and realised then I wanted to be that person leading those investigations. This case, however, was far from straightforward and he needed to pool all the force's resources to find those responsible quickly. Detective Sergeant Jack Regan was his second in command. The community was shocked by this the nature of the assault, the, the fact that the young person had lost his life, that his brother had also been assaulted, and that the group had then made off and, uh, and left basically Christopher to his own fate. This is actually the spot where Christopher's body was found. The fact that Christopher had been assaulted and then hit and dragged by a car presents us with another problem in the investigation because we were going to have to find out what had killed him. Was it the assault? Was it the accident with the car? The cause of death in the UK is typically established by the pathologist during the post-mortem. This will involve looking at the remains or the body to assess any external factors, any evidence that is immediately visible. The first thing the team needed to understand was exactly what had happened that night. This was where the fight took place. So you've got the assailant group coming up the hill. Christopher, his brother, and uh, a friend are walking down here, singing, ordinary Saturday evening, enjoying themselves. And they were singing the Champagne Supernova by Oasis. And as the groups came to pass each other on the footpath by the side of the road, one of the larger group said to the singers, you've got the lyrics wrong. And that, it seems, was the trigger. That was the catalyst that sparked this fight. It was what happened next that would determine what had been the cause of Christopher's death. Christopher had been assaulted. He'd been punched and kicked. He'd been left in the road. At the time of the assault, there's a set of traffic lights approximately 200 metres back along the road. The traffic had been held at red. Those had then changed to green. The traffic had started to move along. It's a dual carriageway, and unfortunately, the woman involved who was driving the car was absolutely distraught, but she had struck Christopher. She hadn't seen him initially, and by the time she realised there was, he was in the carriageway, it was too late for her to stop. At the crime scene, officers had secured the area and were searching for evidence that might help catch the killers. They created a cordon with tape and officers to make sure that the area was kept sterile so that we could have the best chance of recovering scientific evidence. There's a crime scene without a great deal of evidence that's apparent there to the naked eye. I would imagine the investigation would turn much more to the body of the victim to try and understand, well, how was that victim murdered? But there's so many things that detectives would be thinking about doing, even if the crime scene appeared to not be revealing any clues in the first instance. Less than 12 hours after the murder, on Saturday morning in Guildford Police Station, Colin set up a major incident room. He was treating this as a murder investigation. The priorities, as I saw them, that were going to help us to solve this would have been the eyewitnesses. This was, a, although a busy road, it was essentially a residential area in quite a safe area where people would have been alerted by unusual noises and looked out, because that's human nature. Officers had been taking names of local people since they had arrived at the scene. 
There were a large number of witnesses. We had both members of the public who'd been driving along the road at the time, including, unfortunately, the lady who had struck Christopher. But the gist of what they were saying was that there was at least three, possibly four assailants, who most of them saw kicking Christopher whilst he was in the road. The investigation was just beginning, but for Christopher's parents, the cold reality of what had happened that night was now hitting home. I can remember going home after that, after seeing Christopher and thinking, oh my God, these people are on the streets. Who else are they gonna hurt tonight? They've got to catch them quick. Please catch them quick. In a small village just outside Epsom in the Surrey Hills, an 18-year-old boy and his brother had been involved in a vicious fight in the street that had ended in murder. The case of Christopher Donovan was a particularly sad, tragic and upsetting case. It involved uh, three young lads, Christopher, his brother Philip and a friend. They were walking just after midnight on a Friday night along the Yule Bypass when they were attacked by another group who were unknown to them. As a result of the assaults, Christopher tragically lost his life and Philip was also assaulted. Senior investigating officer Colin Sutton had assembled a team to find the killers. They were starting to piece together a picture of Friday night's events. When I came here the day after Christopher was murdered, the first time I visited the scene, this was where I saw there were drag marks in the road. He'd been dragged by the car coming up the hill here. There were already flowers and tributes lying on these walls here. You see that this is now essentially a residential road. There's just lots of houses here. And although it's busy during the daytime, at night it wasn't so busy, and the noise of the fight had alerted many of the residents here, and they'd got to their windows and looked out. And that was going to be the start of how we investigated this and how we found Chris's killers, because we had many more eyewitnesses than we're used to when we're dealing with these sorts of crimes. What the witnesses were telling us, as you'd expect, involved a certain amount of um, confusion because each of them had looked at it at a, a different time. It says witnesses are at the forefront of detectives' minds, and you know we can think of witnesses as, as meaning lots of different things. They, they obviously include eyewitnesses to the event or part of the fatal event, ear witnesses. They might include the paramedics that attended that might have vital information. Where we had members of the public saying, I saw somebody wearing a certain amount of clothing and he was doing this, we had to give that information to the others that were speaking to other people, saying, well, did you see somebody in a pink shirt? Did you see somebody in a hoop shirt? What was he doing? So we had to try and kind of build the picture and try and, and, and prompt, in some ways, the witnesses to make them recall just the small details about clothing and about what people had done, because it was clear that they were going to solve this for us. As the team listened to all the descriptions of what residents had seen on Friday night, they came across their first real clues as to which people in the group had attacked Christopher. Consistently amongst the varied accounts from the various witnesses, we were getting evidence of somebody wearing a pink polo shirt with a number on it, somebody wearing a hoop shirt with white trousers, another hoop shirt but definitely with dark trousers and then somebody else in a dark jacket. And these were four kind of distinctive and distinct combinations of clothing that were being repeated time and again as we were speaking to witnesses. They were coming forward and saying that they'd seen this person wearing that clothing doing a certain act or kicking somebody or hitting somebody. Now they had descriptions, Colin needed to work out the motive for the attack and put together a profile of the potential suspects. We started looking at the background of Christopher and the likely background of the assailants. Christopher was managing a pizza shop. He came from a family where his parents were regular churchgoers and very enthusiastic and committed Christians in their church. He was essentially an ordinary, normal 
18 year old doing his best to start out in life had no kind of associations with criminals or with gangs or with anything, drugs or anything of that nature. The fact that Christopher's not involved in anything like that tends to suggest that that wasn't the motive for the killing and that it's much more likely that it was just as it appeared to be, a stupid, random interaction between two groups of youngsters. By now, word was out in the local community of the events of that Friday night. Carolyn runs a shop in the parade near where the fight broke out. It was shocking at the time, because it's just like a normal situation that you really don't expect to happen, and it's so tragic. And you don't, you don't get an awful lot of punch-ups here. It's quite unusual, so to, to end like that is just dreadful. Christopher's death was also reported on the local news, and Colin appealed for anyone with information to come forward. On the Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, somebody called the police and gave us a couple of names of people who they say had been involved in the fight in the assailant group. Following that initial call, the floodgates opened and more names started to be linked to the attackers. People wanted to help. We had intelligence, we had people helping us and people saying, you need to look at these, this particular group, these particular individuals, because we think they're involved. But there's a, a big jump from thinking somebody's involved to being able to prove in a court that they're involved. And while we had people giving us names, we were going to rely on these people around here to give us the evidence to prove that they did it. Colin decided he needed to contact some of these named suspects to see if he could link them to the attack. So if they've been involved in a fight, you might actually have material under their fingernails or blood on their clothing or hair or fibres, something that would tie them to your victim. The decision was made to arrest these two or three young men on the Saturday night. The suspects were all from the local area. All the names that we'd received, all these people that we suspected, were young men who lived in and around this estate, most of them with, with their parents still. They were aged at the time between 16 and 20 years, had all been to school nearby, but none of them what you would call a career criminal or anybody who was a, a regular at the police station or regularly arrested. It was only 24 hours after the attack. Colin asked a family liaison officer to visit Christopher's family and bring them up to date. And the doorbell rang, half past 11, then we get a time, and I went, who the hell's it now? Went down, it's our liaison officer. And she had a big smile on her face, she went, we've got them. And I never thought I'd dance with a policewoman. We were dancing in the hallway. A dawn raid was planned to bring them in. The morning of the arrest, we had five separate teams who were making simultaneous raids on dwellings, houses and flats within this area. All the suspects were arrested simultaneously and searches made of the houses, and they were taken to separate police stations so that they could be questioned and we could try to establish what went on. With suspects in custody, Colin and the team had a limited time to question them before they had to decide to charge them with murder. By the time we got to Sunday morning and we had the team meeting on the Sunday morning, we've got the additional burden of having three prisoners in custody who need to be interviewed, who need to have their swabs and samples taken from them and all the other things that we do with major crime. I suspect that they were looking to be able to find a connection between the suspects and either the scene of the crime or the victim. <laughs> It was reported that this process was actually hindered because of the nature of the incident. So Christopher was not only attacked, but he was run over by a vehicle. And there was a level of interference with dirt and oil on the wheels and on the vehicle itself that prevented some of this analysis being conducted. Although we took all the samples, we didn't find any forensic evidence from them. They as is so common, were advised not to talk to us and say no comment when they're interviewed. We know we haven't got enough evidence to charge them at the moment. The only thing that we can sensibly do is to bail them to come back to the police station at a later date. Colin and his team had now met three of the named youths, Stephen Andrews, Ryan Seymour 
and an unnamed younger boy. But without concrete proof linking them to the killing, they had to release them again. You know, we sat down after they'd done the interviews to discuss what happened, and the general feeling amongst us all was that we were probably looking at the right group of people. It was now a race to gather more evidence and bring Christopher's killers to justice. I just, I couldn't understand why. Why would somebody do such a terrible thing? It had been 36 hours since 18-year-old Christopher Donovan had been brutally attacked and left for dead in a Surrey street. Police had identified a gang of youths they suspected might be responsible. What we were learning was this was an attack that was both unnecessary and extremely violent. Christopher had been knocked to the floor and then whilst he was on the floor, he'd been kicked a considerable number of times and that was around the head and the upper body area. 28 witnesses in that street came forward. 28 witnesses, I never had so many witnesses to a murder case before. It was headline news in the local paper. I still remember the boy's face in his school photo. It did seem to hit the area. When people were sort of talking about it, we thought it was just a punch-up gone wrong, really. By Sunday, police had arrested and released several suspects and also now knew the names of most of the other youths who had been in the group of attackers. Some of them started to talk. It then became apparent that there'd been this party up on the Yule Bypass at this flat above the shops, and people were telling us that, yes, you know, it was this group and their friends and their associates who were mostly the partygoers at this house party. In that group, there were people who were absolutely disgusted with what had happened and had taken no part in it and wanted to make sure that their story was told before anybody else had the opportunity to suggest that they'd been involved. When you get large groups in a crime like this, they're automatically going to deny, blame each other. And it might not have been that they were the main aggressor. Um, they may have struck the, the victim, they may have done something, but they won't feel like they are the main perpetrator. So I think there'll be people who are actually trying to be deceptive, and then there'll be the people who are so afraid aren't really aware of what their role was or don't feel that sense of responsibility. Now increasingly sure they knew who the killers were, but without evidence to hold them, the police needed to be clear who had done what. The evidence we were getting from the eyewitnesses was of a pretty sort of savage fight. No knives or guns or weapons, but hand-to-hand -hand punching, kicking, people falling over, being punched to the ground, getting back up, carrying on. Christopher had been the main recipient of the attack. He was on the floor, adopted what appeared to be a fetal-type position, and that they were repeatedly kicking him and also possibly stamping on him. The brutality was considerable. This took place over a reasonably protracted time. It was going on for a whole minute. So we had pretty good information as to what went on and what was happening in the fight. And some of that information, to a greater or less degree, described what the people who took part were wearing. You know, it came down to a problem of analysis, really. That it's something you do just by as you might imagine, drawing up a matrix and, and saying, you know, witness A says, I saw this happening, and across the top you list the clothing. And so you end up with blue and white hooped T-shirt. Witness A says they saw him kick the man in the green jacket. Witness B said they saw him punch him. Witness C didn't see him do anything at all, and so on. And eventually you can build a sort of a composite story as to what must have gone on. By doing this analysis, we were able to kind of work out who had done what. But that who only related back to clothing. It didn't relate to an individual. 
I think it takes a good detective to take those little nuggets of information from one witness or perhaps a number of witnesses and begin to connect them together. Different people have different bits of information because they've been out on a house-to-house -house inquiry and it's so important to the SIO that people feed back information and then it's the SIO's job with, with his senior team to sort of sit back and think, OK, what have we got here? Who else might we be able to speak to in that street that might have also heard something at three o'clock in the morning that might be important? So, yeah, lots and lots of bringing together little tiny bits of information can paint the picture quite clearly. The team had been searching the local area for CCTV cameras that might have caught the events of that Friday night so they could put names to the descriptions. We had CCTV images from the petrol station here which came out across the forecourt. Although the petrol station was closed at the time, it was able to cover this footpath and just about the other side of the road. So we were able to identify the main part of the group as they'd walked towards the party. When we looked at the CCTV from the SO garage, it just showed three young men. It didn't show the whole group. So we were kind of half the group missing. And that meant we had to cast the net more widely around here. And that resulted in my officers going to the station down at Stonely and finding that half the group had actually been on the train, come back from Clapham Junction to Stonely, and they'd met up down there uh, where the party was taking place. As the local community heard about the initial arrests, more information came into police that allowed them to further track the suspect's movements. It was a phone call in from somebody who lived on the Water's Edge estate where the bulk of the uh, assailant group lived. And they said that three of them they knew had gone on the train to Clapham Junction to go and buy some speed, I think. We had CCTV from the railway station. The group that had travelled by rail had then gone to a nearby off-licence and had bought some alcohol in the, to take to the party. So we had CCTV from there. And we also had CCTV which showed the initial group, minus those others that had travelled by train, walking along the uh, Yule Bypass. We had good, clear CCTV images of their clothing. That fed in nicely to information we were getting from the house-to-house -house inquiries. The team now had footage of all the suspects they believed were involved in the fight. So you've got three from that direction, three from that direction. They meet together here, they get some beer, they go into a party. Our group is complete. We've got all the people who are described by our witnesses together an hour or two before Christopher is murdered. With the events of Friday night mapped out and evidence tying the suspects to the scene, the team were closing in on the killers. Once we were able to look at the CCTV footage and take the, the best still frames that we could to start identifying clothing, it became clear that some of the distinctive clothing that the residents here were telling us they had seen on the assailants when the attack took place, we could see that clothing in our CCTV stills. With what Colin now felt was enough evidence to definitely link the suspects with the crime, the decision was made to arrest them again. This time, however, the arresting officers also had another objective. When they were first arrested and we didn't have the information from the eyewitnesses about clothing, then the officers were just looking for the normal sort of things like bloodstained clothing or weapons or that sort of thing. When we went back, we could be much more discriminating about what we took. We knew that we were looking for certain items of clothing, certain distinctive items of clothing that would tie in with what our witnesses were telling us. If they could find these items, they could tie their named suspects to both the scene of the crime and the witnesses' descriptions. There were things that were unusual, things that were quite distinctive. A pink polo shirt with a large blue number two on the back, a blue and white hooped shirt, a black and white hoop shirt. And so once we found those in the possession of people that we say other people have told us were there at the time, then the case begins to mount up. The prime suspects were again in custody, and this time the police hoped they had enough evidence to charge them with the murder of Christopher Donovan. After the gang were arrested for the second time, 
we presented them with the increased amount of evidence that we'd found. With the new CCTV evidence, the team could show that the suspects were in the area and wearing the clothes seized at their houses. Each admitted that he had been there, that he'd seen the fight take place, but equally each denied that he'd taken part in the actual assault. Colin charged their three prime suspects with murder. Now he had to convince a jury it was their actions that had killed Christopher. In the early hours of Saturday the 26th of May, a group of youths had got into a fight with Christopher Donovan, his brother Philip, and a friend in a vicious, unprovoked attack. Christopher later died in hospital before his parents could see him. You get up in the morning and everything's fine, and then at the end of the day, your whole life has been thrown out the window and you can't get a handle on anything. That's the way it is, it's that quick. Your life is never going to be the same. An officer had promised the family they would find those responsible, and only two days later, DCI Colin Sutton and his team had arrested a number of youths they believed had been responsible for killing Christopher. So we have three charged. Of those, two were charged because eyewitnesses had been firm in saying to us, the men in the striped T-shirts struck Christopher Donovan and they had contributed to his death. The third man, wearing the black leather jacket and identifiable because of a baseball cap, had been seen by witnesses to throw a punch. We weren't sure that he'd punched Christopher Donovan. He was actually the only man against whom we got any forensic evidence because the leather jacket which he was wearing was found to have a speck of blood on its cuff. And that blood came not from Christopher Donovan, but from his brother. Now, legally, there is a rule which is known as joint enterprise. And that says that if you are in a group of people and you together attack somebody else and somebody dies, if you are all in it together, you're all part of the same action in attacking those people, then you are all guilty of whatever consequences come of it. So for that reason, although we only ever proved that this man in the leather jacket had struck Christopher Donovan's brother, he was still able to be charged with the murder. It was a breakthrough. The police believed they had their killers, but the suspects were denying having worn the incriminating clothes the night of the fight. Realising that clothing was key to this investigation, we had to devise a system to get that clothing to these different scenes. Uh, and how could we do it? What we had to bear in mind was the clothing that had been seized had been to the forensic laboratory. So, undertaken tests, we don't know what test they consisted, chemicals had been used. So, therefore, it was not practical to expect people to put that clothing on and take them to these scenes. The obvious solution was to get tailors' dummies, mannequins, put them on those, we could bring them to each of the scenes, we could transport them, and we could then use them to show that the clothing we had was the same clothing as the CCTV was showing the group members were wearing at the time. On the one hand, you have the CCTV image taken on the night that Christopher Donovan was murdered, half an hour before he was murdered. Here are their clothes in front of the same camera at the same time of night, same lighting conditions. Look, it's identical. We've got the right people, we've got their clothes. It's these men that killed him. Colin was hoping this was what was needed to convince a jury they had the right people, but they had one more piece of evidence to obtain. There was a question as to whether or not the causation for an offensive murder could be established. Is it fair to say, is it right to say that legally, those who assaulted him, those who punched him, are legally responsible for his death? Colin took the parents to see the coroner to discuss Christopher's injuries. The coroner took over an hour to explain his injuries, because my son Philip wants to know the ins and outs of the duck's backside. And in the end, I said, you can just shut up. 
I just want to see him. I don't want to hear no more. I've had enough. Nearly every bone in his body was broken from the kicking in the car, the brain damage, everything else. And the coroner looked at us and she, she said to me, I've got bad news. I said, what can be worse than that? She said, because of the kicking in the car, we're going to have to prove what killed him. And to do this, I'm going to remove his brain, wait for an enzyme to come out, and you can't bury Chris for 16 weeks. That was the hardest thing, wasn't it? Christopher's brain was examined by the top expert in brain injuries in the country. And the doctors together came to the conclusion that essentially Christopher's injuries from the neck upwards were due to the assault and all those injuries on his body were due to being dragged along by the car. They were able to make that distinction for us and then go further and say what killed Christopher was the blow to his head. Sadly, Christopher had sustained such severe injuries during the assault that no matter what happened to him after that, he wouldn't have survived. So the car colliding with him and dragging him along the road was completely irrelevant. Getting this essential evidence meant that Christopher's body could not be released to his parents until after the court case. So we had to wait nearly a year to go to Yale Bailey. In that time, we buried Chris. And the hardest thing for me was, I was walking down um, New Morden High Street, and I walked into The Undertaker's. He said, can I help you? I, yeah, my son's been murdered, and I'm going to have to bury him in 16 weeks. Sit down, have a cup of tea. And she chatted to me, she said, this is the first murder we've ever done, so we really had to work together on this. And she said, now I'm going to tell you, you're not alone. You can come in there every day, have a cup of tea and a chat. And that was like my counselling. I'd go in there every day and talk about Chris, and they'd listen. They, they, they didn't say, look, we've got, we're, we're, just sit and relax. And then the hardest thing was me and Vi having to go into that place and pick his coffin. The initial hearings for the suspects now named as Stephen Andrews, Ryan Seymour, and an unnamed minor were held in Guildford Crown Court. The defendants all pleaded not guilty, and eventually, after the normal sort of remands and preliminary hearings, uh, the trial was set for April 2002 at the Old Bailey. As evidence was presented in the Old Bailey, the suspects continued to insist their innocence. During the trial, the three accused really had very little contact with each other. They were each blaming each other for the assaults, denying that they were involved. They were gonna use a cutthroat defense, which basically means that I don't accept anything, I blame the others. But of course, the danger of a cutthroat defense is that you never know what the other person's gonna say against you. We had a situation, for example, they'd gone to London to buy drugs. Initially, it was suggested it was cannabis, but in fact, one of the uh, defendants, in blaming a co-defendant, said, no, the reason we went there was he wanted to get crack because it says nobody would go to Clapham Junction to buy cannabis. So we had a situation, whilst they were blaming each other, they were also effectively stabbing each other because they were trying to get themselves off of the murder charge by blaming one of the other defendants. Christopher's parents were in court for most of the trial. The hardest is listening to the lies. I was wearing that jacket, no, he was wearing that jacket, and it goes on and on, six weeks of lies. You're putting your trust in the, the evidence the police have got. You're putting your trust in not just Colin Sutton and the whole of the police, that they got everything right. And if they got everything right, then we're going to get what we want, guilty. As we came towards the end of the trial, you know, you, you've got all those kind of doubts and um, fears, I suppose, and hopes that you always have in these cases. And uh, although it's very easy now, dispassionately, to say, you know, our job is to present the evidence and the jury make the decision. The truth is that you form some sort of attachment and investment in these cases and you want to succeed uh, because you want to see justice done. And so when the time that the foreman stands up and is asked to reveal the verdict is always stressful for everybody. You know, it's stressful for the officers, it's stressful for the defendants, it's stressful for the families of the victims. The case was six weeks, and it was so astonishing. And we were called in, it was a Friday, 
the jury were now to come back. We can't make our mind up. We came back Monday. They went out, came back in, can't make our mind up. The judge said, I'll take 11 to 1. We went outside, didn't we? And I said to Colin, oh, let's go and get a cup of tea. While well, we're waiting, he went, they'll be back in 10 minutes, he said. They came back. They also had the youngest, the youngest one, how did they find him? Guilty. The second youngest, guilty. The third youngest, guilty. I was not elated. I was just relieved that we'd been able to do a professional job, that we'd been able to establish who was responsible and convince a jury that they were the people who were responsible, that we were able to give Ray, Vi and Philip an idea of exactly what had happened and why it had happened. I was also aware that nobody's a winner here. With every murder, the whole community is affected. We think that if we live a good life and we're careful, it won't happen to us. Whereas in a case like this, you've got somebody who's just been out with his brother, walking down the road, and that means it could be me, it could happen to me. So there's a real sense of fear in the community that if that happened to them, that happened to their children, it could happen to my child. While waiting for a sentence, Christopher's parents were taken to the court restaurant. While we were in the canteen, another father walked in, one of the fathers. And I turned to buy, as soon as I found guilty, I turned to buy and said, there's no winners. We all lost today. Everybody's lost a son. People often say that a court case brings closure to those who have lost a loved one to murder. In my experience, that's not the case. You, you know, you, you never have closure on these things. Uh, you lose a loved one to a tragic and, and senseless murder. It's something which stays with you to the end of your life, and uh, people cope with it and they deal with it, but I don't think they ever truly get over it or truly forget it. As the killers served their sentences, Christopher's parents struggled to cope with the loss of their son. Any kind of murder like this puts a strain on any marriage. And it's made worse by the fact that you tiptoe around each other because you don't want to talk about it because you don't want to hurt each other. And so you keep your thoughts to yourself and you don't talk and therefore, and after a while, it becomes the normal of not talking. 10 years later, when the sentences had been served, Christopher's parents decided the only way they could make their peace was to meet their son's killers. First thing I clocked, he had a suit, shirt and tie, polished shoes and a haircut. And I thought, that's respect. As he walked in the room, I stood up and went like that. He came over, put his arms around me and whispered, thank you. He then looked at you, didn't he? May I hug you? And I can't believe I said yes. It's like he's 26 now, he's not 15 anymore, but he still looks like a little boy. And, and so we hug and... I say, hey, young man, do you know that we both forgive you? Move on into the future and have the life Chris can't have. And it's coming out of my mouth, and I start feeling it. I really feel it. Like it's, gosh. And it, it was almost like he'd taken a sack of coal off his back and put it down. You can physically see his shoulders go down. And I think we both did we both the did. same. It was that instant of humanity. When the young men were convicted of his murder, there was a certain degree of relief, I think, on the part of Christopher's family that at least justice had been done. But of course, justice being done never brings back your loved one that's been murdered, and they've had to deal with that in the subsequent years and have dealt with it in a remarkable way.